there's a lot of folks out there, and this is just my guesstimation, okay? There's a lot of folks out there that believe that if they don't pray in accordance with their faith, that somehow they're not doing the memorial service of justice. Let's remember what the focus and mission is for the DAV on page five of this document. It says we're non-sectarian. Does everybody know what that means? It means we're non-religious, which means we're all encompassing of all faiths, okay? That's what we have to adhere to. It also says we're non-politic, or uh, we're, we're non-political, uh, okay? I'll get there, guys, I'm so tired. You have to just, just be, bear with me, okay? I may get tongue-tied. Matter of fact, I'm surprised I even left the nominating committee uh, all in one piece. But anyway, it's all good. <laughs> hey, you'd be surprised what a couple of jokes would get you to get you out of the nominating committee early. So on page five, it says we're non-secretarian, so when we conduct our memorial services at the chapter and department level, let's keep the mission and uh, the focus on what our uh, organization is. Now, I need to remind you, let me remind you guys, yours the one, you are the ones that have approved this document. You approved it. So then why do you wanna go and then go against it? Page five. I just told you where to find it, and the members approve this. Now, if you want me to assist you in conducting a memorial service, let me know. I will send you all the help and assistance I can give without my being there to make sure you have a proper memorial service. But guys, we have Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Christian, and a few other faiths that are part of the makeup of the DAV. If we're non-secretarian, then that means our memorial services should be all-encompassing for all those faiths, correct? So if we're doing something unique that's specific to a faith-based event, then we're not encompassing everybody. What is the requirement to be a member of the DAV? Who knows this? What's the requirement? Be a disabled veteran that served during a time of war honorably. That's all the requirement is. So when you conduct your memorial services, and then I go out to these departments, and commanders, if I've got commanders out here, or department chaplains, or uh, chapter chaplains, uh, Keep in mind what the focus is of our mission and adhere to the memorial service from that perspective. I'll be more than happy, as I said earlier, I will send you material to help you do your memorial service in a proper manner. Now, let's address some prayer questions that I got prior to coming up here. I'm going to reveal to you what my belief is so that you can understand from the perspective, as your national chaplain, how we conduct business. I'm a believer in Christ. Everyone understand that? But I am not a Christian. How can you be a believer in Christ and not be a Christian? Well, here's what I believe. I believe that the term Christian is used by the outside world as it was in Antioch in the book of Acts. So people looking in can call me a Christian, but I won't call me a Christian because I'll tell you why. I'm imperfect. I'm a human, I make mistakes. I try to walk the walk of my faith, but it doesn't always happen. And for some of you who've been around me long enough, after about three days of me, you can't stand me. Well, you guys are lucky, you get to go home. But I have to go home with myself, I don't get a break. I'm just saying, it's just what it is. So here's the deal, guys. From my faith perspective as your national chaplain, all the members, encompassing all the faiths have elected me and therefore I will represent all faiths involved in this organization. It's a formality and that's we got to get out of the mindset that somehow if I conduct a church service then we call it a memorial service that somehow I'm not doing my God justice. Get rid of that. That's just a mentality. What I do up here is a formality. Now, when I'm away from this organization, I am who I am. 
but I live who I am while I'm in this organization. I don't deny who, what my faith is. Everyone understand, am I getting too complicated? I don't want to. I just want you to understand the perspective in which we need to be conducting our more moral services. If it was a Jewish rabbi, if it was a Muslim cleric, and they were the national chaplain, they would have to adhere to the same rules that I'm adhering to and have to adhere to based on the Constitution and bylaws. There is no uh, give or take there. So everybody understand that when you go back to your departments and chapters, you need to be thinking about how to do one properly. And if you all attended the memorial service this morning, you get a good idea how it should be conducted. And it can vary. It doesn't have to be exactly like I conducted it. Okay? It can vary. You know your community. You know what's appropriate as long as you adhere and stay within the mission of the DAV. All right. Now, anybody have any questions on that? Because if you do, I'm just simply going to point you to the Constitution bylaws and say, read the book. Okay? All right, guys. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Awesome. All right. Well, look, guys, I think a chaplain's responsibility in the DAV can assist the commander in bridging gaps between generations. Our problem is, is we've got, in my travels across the United States, we have older veterans, we have younger veterans, we have veterans like me. I'm in the middle, okay? I'm not old when I'm with you, I'm considered young. But when I'm with my kids, I'm old as Methuselah. It's just what it is, okay? So the reality of it is here, guys, is that we have a responsibility to assist our commanders and the line officers to help bridge the gap between generations. First of all, you need to know what generation you came from. You need to understand how that generation thinks, and then you need to know how to communicate to that generation, because here's the deal. If you're a chapter and you have older members, and you're not getting any new members, it's because there's a lack of communication and you don't know how to talk to the younger members. Chaplains, you are a pivot point in the chapter to make that bridge, that crossing, all right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna discuss, next slide please, the four types of generations we're dealing with right now. So you have veterans, those that were born 1925 to 1944, you have boomers, 1945, 64. This, oh, by the way, this is not an exact science, all right? I just did some research, pulled out some figures, laid it out there based on my best ability to do what I needed to do. Gen X generation, 1965 to 81, and millennials to 1977 to 94. I have two of them living in my, well, they did live in my house, and a grandson who's picking up their bad habits. All right, so let's talk about post-war veterans. Those are the individuals that were born prior to World War II or right at the end of World War II. So here's the deal. When they were born, there were significant opportunities in jobs and education. Now, I'm taking the long way here to show you the difference between how each generation thinks. If you understand how the generation thinks, you're gonna be able to better communicate with those individuals, okay? And that's our job as chaplains. Post-war economic boom struck America. Why? Because when World War II ramped up, we had manufacturing kicking into gear, and then it just created all kinds of jobs for everybody. Then when we got out, you had the automobile business. You had uh, uh, enough money to go buy a house now, and so the housing market came up. All that was what was going on with this particular generation. Now, Cold War tensions were beginning, okay? And there was some discomfort and uncertainty throughout our nation during that time because we had Russia took over half of Europe at the time, for those of you that remember that, after we just sat there and fought hard, defeating one bad regime, then another bad regime comes in and takes over. All right? Value, security, comfort, familiar, known activities, environments were all part of that generation. Okay? Next, please. Let's talk about the boomers. I'm part of that group. They also had good op uh, uh, opportunity, uh, economic opportunities. They were largely optimistic. They saw the future and they say, yeah, let's go for it. It was 
peacetime during that time, except for 1950 when the uh, Korean War broke out. But the, generally, they were optimistic. But during this time, we had President Kennedy and Martin Luther King assassinations. That kind of changed the face of everything. Civil rights movement was during this time. The Vietnam War took place. And then the epidemic of AIDS broke out for this generation right here. And most of us lost trust in the government. And there's nothing with losing trust in your government. I think it's a healthy thing to lose trust in your government because the government should always be accountable to the people. But it's taken too far if you think you need to destroy the government. That's my personal opinion, okay? Did I cover all those points up here? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> That's why he's up there doing that. All right, let's talk about the Generation Xers, 1965 to 81. They were latchkey kids. A lot of dysfunctionality here. Chaplains, you need to be aware that dysfunctionality breeds dysfunctionality. You usually can tell when you're talking to someone what their background usually is. And if you talk to them long enough or you're with them long enough, you're going to find out what their background is without having to pry and poke because people love to talk. And they'll tell you what's going on in their life. Easy. Especially if you're a chaplain. You got chaplain in front of your name, you're a trusted individual. So when they give you this information, you must, in confidence, protect that information. Unless it's a murder, then you have a right to report it, okay? Lowest voting participation rate of any generation. They didn't want to be involved in government politics. This is Generation Xers. High levels of skepticism. So we went from boomers who had a, uh, uh, had a great outlook on life to their children who ended up being exposed to lots of daycare and divorce, and now they're skeptical about everything. Next. That's the guys, what's in it for me? You know those folks. You haven't met any though, right? You have many of those folks that says, what's in it for me? Okay. But they are really educated well. Okay, next. They may have a higher level of caution or pragmatism. Next. Repetition for the worst music to ever gain popularity. That's this generation right here. Absolutely. Have you ever thought about listening to music on the radio and saying, man, what is that? I can't believe they call that music now. Horrible, absolutely horrible. Millennials, now this is the bigger group, 1977 to 94. These are the folks that are now becoming members of our organization, known as incredibly sophisticated and technically wise. I, uh, when I left the line company went to staff, I didn't know what a computer was. Then I sat down at the desk and I'm issued a computer and I had no clue how to open it, power up, and this young PFC, you know, the kind, the horn room glasses, he's got to look. And for three days he sat down next to my desk and I wouldn't let him go to the bathroom until I knew how to operate that thing from soup to nuts. That's how I learned about the computer. But these guys, the millennials, they'll dance around you on technology. Smartphones, iPads, they'll make uh, phone calls and, and oh my goodness. My two children, when I call them on the phone, I don't get a response, it goes right to the message. But if I text them, within 30 seconds I get a response. Because they're, they're like this. They're the guys that are sitting next to you. Let me explain to you how it goes in my house. So we have an Easter dinner or, uh, or Christmas dinner or something. They're all at my house. We're sitting in the same room. Grandpa's ready to talk. I'm ready to, you know, FaceTime. Everybody is all buried into their little smartphone, and they are talking to one another by sending texts, and they're sitting right next to the individual. That's this generation. So now we have a new rule in my house. All smartphones are left on the kitchen table. You can't take it any further in the house. Immune to most traditional marketing sales pitches. You remember those times when marketers would come up to your uh, front porch and sell you a vac vacuum cleaner or something? These guys aren't phased by it. They're like, get out of my face. That's basically this millennial group, okay? Get out of my face. You, I don't have to buy that. I'll buy what I want. They are much more radically and ethically diverse They cross cultural lines. Maybe something the older generation could learn from them. 
They have no problem crossing the line whatsoever. Yes, ma'am. Racially and, what did I say? <laughs> well, they're radical. They are radical in that. <laughs> Thank you, dear. I appreciate that. Awesome. They are racially and ethically diverse. And you know what? I'm the one who put this together. Chaplains anyway. do make mistakes. <laughs> no, it wasn't a mistake. It was a word. But they are radical in their thinking in terms of cross-culture, okay? Flexible and changing in fashion and style consciousness. These are the guys that will get three or four guys together and go get an apartment and live together. And they have no problem doing it. I couldn't do that. Man, I gotta have my peace. When, when I'm in the bathroom, you better not come in on me. But these guys, they're more communal. And they have no problem sharing the load. My son is big time into this. All right? Raised in dual income or single parent families. That's their background where they come from. Remember, just prior to that, you had Gen X. And what was their background? They were latchkey kids, right? Dysfunctionality breeds dysfunctionality. So the result of these guys is that they come from single parent families, most of them, okay? Now, before you jump on me, after I just told you, we need to adhere to the Constitution bylaws and we're not gonna show our faith. I have to show you this particular scripture of my faith because this scripture is gonna bring home what and reinforce what I just talked about. This particular scripture in my faith says that we become what we need to become to talk to other people. That's basically what the scripture says. That's from my faith perspective. We need to become what we need to become to communicate with other people. Now there's a lot more in that scripture, but because I'm uh, your national chaplain, I'll let you read it for yourself and you can figure out what the rest is. All right, moving right along. So with that said, and that in mind, we need to become chaplains, what we need to become to communicate to the younger generation so they can become members of the DAV and take us into the future. Uh, go back, go back. All right, chart work document. Did you all get that passed out? Yes, sir, what you got? Say again, I'll have to watch. Oh, uh, pull the scripture back up, please. First Corinthians chapter nine, verse 19, 23. Now that's from my faith perspective. I don't know what your faith perspective is, and I'm not trying to you know, impose my faith on you. I'm just giving you an example of what my faith teaches me I need to do, okay? That's what my faith teaches me that you do. But I wanted to put it up there because I want to make my point. We cannot have tunnel vision when we're in our chapter meetings. Let me give you a story. Had a young veteran who was made the department adjutant, doing a great job, very motivated, was learning, made mistakes. That's what we do as we learn when we begin. And then in whatever department you're in, based on your department constitution bylaws, the commander can pick another adjutant if they want, right? So the department commander who's elected in my presence commenced to talking to this young veteran saying, you're not gonna be my adjutant after this young person has been an adjutant for two years because you make too many mistakes and you don't know everything yet. So he puts into place an older gentleman, older veteran, who's probably been adjutant for 15 or so years. And so my question was, and again, the commander can make their decision, what the commander can make their, I, I, I can't change the commander's mind. If the DEC's there, they can improve his decision, if that's what your uh, bylaws talk about. But here's the hypocrisy of that decision. Not even 30 minutes prior to that decision being made, he was talking about how we need younger members in our... <laughs> and oh, by the way, the millennials, in case you didn't get it, they, oh, we're gonna talk about that here. They wanna be in charge, they want responsibility. When you get a young veteran in your chapter, you need to find a job for them. You need to find them a job. Make them productive members. And I'll tell you what, they are on point. You give them a mission, they're gonna go out and, and uh, carry out the commander's intent. Now, they need guidance because we're not military. <laughs> so we don't want them running over you know, other cars and stuff to make that mission happen. They're, they're not in uniform anymore. But what we wanna do is we wanna bounce it out with teaching and here's what the problem is. Why couldn't the commander have just simply guided that young 
veteran. He'd already been doing it for two years, probably was starting to get good at it, I would imagine, right? So we as chaplains have to look at the big picture, and it's our job to inform the commander when we believe he's wrong, which is more important why you need to know the Constitution and bylaws, because you just don't go to the commander and say, you can't do that. You need to be backed up with what the members have voted on and approved. Okay? Know your department constitution bylaws. Know your chapter constitution bylaws. Uh, how did we get back here? What did I do? You moved back. Uh, did, I, you, did I move yeah, back? Yeah, you moved oh, back. Generation. Oh, I'm sorry. Generation Act. Uh, all right, so you had this. Do you want Generation Act? No, no, no. Go, go to the next one. Okay. All right, everyone got uh, passed out. We passed out a chart board document yeah. that looks just like this. This is a really good reference thing that you can have. Find out on the left side of the paper, find out what generation, if we don't have any more, I'll make copies, okay? Find out where you fit into it, and then when you want to talk to another generation that's not you at the top, find out where the two meet, and it tells you exactly what they're all about and how to approach them. I've tried to make this as simple as I can for you, because look, I've been doing this for a while, and I don't have it perfected, okay? And once in a while, once in a while, well, once in a while, I don't know. Uh, once in a while, I mess it up. It is what it is. All right? No one's perfect. I don't expect anybody else to be perfect. But here's what I do expect. I expect us to come together as a team, chaplains. And when you don't know, you need to be reaching out. And if I don't know, I know a whole bunch of chaplains that do know. And there's, there's chaplains that I do trust. I don't, did you know I didn't know everything? You didn't know that, did you? You did not know. Well, let me tell you now so you're not disappointed later. I don't know everything, all right? But what I do know, I'm pretty good at. And I'm still learning. And I'm learning a lot from you. So chaplains, our job is to pull from one another, encourage one another, lift each other up, draw information from one another. That's our job, all right? This chart work document, anybody have any questions on how to read it? That's for you. If you want me to send you an email copy after the seminar, come up here, put your name on a sheet of paper, I will send you. There are no secrets here. That is not a registered trademark. My job is to make sure you're informed that you can do the best job you can at your level. Okay, guys? I want to help you. I want to make you successful. That's my job. Unless I'm not reelected again, then it'll be someone else's job. But as long as I'm your national chaplain, I want you to be successful, which makes the organization successful. What better way to assist someone? Have you, when, you, when you do someone's benefit paperwork and then they come back and they say, thank you so much, isn't that worth all the money in the world that you've stepped out and done something? Has any chaplains here been service officers? Very good, yeah, right. Guys, maybe you need to consider being a service officer. Ministry in many ways. Okay, next please. So let's talk about communicating to these various veterans we talked about. All right, here's the deal, guys. We have to build trust through inclusive language. This young veteran example that I just told you about, that was relieved of duty, so to speak, after two years in the position. How do you think that uh, veteran now views the department? If she's, if, if, if the if he or she is mature, and most of them are, they'll take it with a grain of salt, okay? But in most cases, we have to build trust with these guys. We're talking specifically about the millennials, all right? They're the biggest group, we want them in. They're the ones that are out there now trying to find a purpose in life. We can give them that purpose. Words are gospel, you say it. When I tell you something, you say, hey, National, National Chapman, he told me. Now, whatever I told you has just become gospel. You're going to run with it. Well, look, guys, if I tell you something, I probably got good reason to tell you something, but you need to follow up and do your own research, and you never know. I might be missing something. And you may find something else. Hey, National Chapman, did you know? No, I didn't. Thanks for telling me. And I can edit. That's what it's all about, guys. Body language. Make sure that whoever you're talking to, the millennial, once you understand who they are, talk their same language. Get down to their level and talk the way they talk. Because if you're not doing that, they're not listening. Because they're thinking that you don't care. 
Follow me so far? Use more formal language. Boy, you'd be surprised how smart these guys are. When I was in the military, we had a lot of high-tech instrumentation and technology that was just phenomenal for its time. Now, they've got, what do they call them? Uh, uh, unmanned uh, aircraft that fit in the palm of your hand. It folds up, sticks into your belt. They can toss it over a berm. The squad leader or his designated representative can look on this video screen before they even go across the berm and find out what's on the other side. That's how technically suave this generation is. What used to take a lieutenant back in my time, specialists can do it now. That's how smart. We need to give these guys credit. But we also need to remember that if they come and they're new into our organization, we're not going to throw them up into leadership, right? We as chaplains need to recognize such things. Now, from my faith perspective, I can think of a number of scriptures that says we don't throw young people into ministry positions right off the bat. I'm just saying, okay? So the same principle applies. All right? Use more formal language next. Don't expect them to share their thoughts until trust is built. Go back up to point one. If trust is not built, they're not going to talk to you. If you don't know how to operate a computer, you've lost them already. If you're not using a smartphone, they're moving out. Okay, if you can't text them, it's gone. We need to speak their language. If I want to talk to my daughter and my son, I'm going to text them because that's the quickest response I get and that's how they respond to me. I'm not going to alienate them because they want to text and dad doesn't. It's not going to happen. I want to talk to my kids. I want to talk to my grandson. Don't waste their time. They don't like their time wasted at all, period. They have a job to do. They, they want to go and do the job. So what that means is be brief with them. Do not give them long dissertations about life because they don't want to hear it. They got short-term memory. I call it the, the Hollywood, um, um, oh, what did I used to call it? Uh, anyway, call it the Hollywood something where we are bombarded with 30 second stuff and then it's gone. That's how you have to talk to these guys in little bits and bites. If you go over a minute or two minutes talking to them, you lost them, all right? Face-to-face -face or communication is received best because you want their attention. Or if you're writing an email or texting, written communication, that's how you're gonna get it. All right, next. Communicating with boomers, here we go. If you wanna to talk to me, I'm a boomer. If you're a Vietnam vet, you're a boomer. So if you wanna to talk to me, this is what you gotta do. You gotta speak in an open and direct style with plenty of body language. Now, I don't do that at all. No, no. Uh, that is not me. <laughs> we lost, I've lost you already. See, you don't even wanna communicate with me. All right, so you see how I'm talking, right? Answer questions frankly and thoroughly and expect to be pressed for details. Look, I'm up front with people when I ask a question and I require details. When my wife tells me when I'm watching the Super Bowl to take out the trash, what goes in my mind is I'll take it out at halftime. But what's in her mind is you need to take it out now because it stinks. Now, I'll tell you some of the marital issues that I've had to deal with because I thought wrong. But, <laughs> but but needless to say, there it is. And you've all heard me talk about the four marriage counselors I've been to in my life. She speaks Southern, I speak country. We had to go through four marriage counselors to work out the linguistics. Next, please. Do not use controlling manipulative language. Man, these guys, I do not like to be manipulated. Tell me, just tell me up front that I owe you 20 bucks. Don't let me go and order the dinner, and next thing you know, you're attacking on a $5 surcharge and a $15 or 15%. Just tell me up front, oh yeah, I don't have a problem paying you. I came with lots of money. The problem I have it with is that you weren't up front with me in the beginning. That's the problem I have. So when you're talking to me, just be, be up and straight up and honest. All right, ask for provide options to demonstrate flexibility and thinking. Don't. When you, when you tell them something, don't make it in stone. Give them the flexibility 
to think of an alternative way to make something happen, right? Give them that, but if you tell them, no, this is the way it's gonna be, you just turn me off, I'm out the door. We still talk about board? Yeah, okay, that's me, all right? Give me some flexibility, let me think about it a little bit, okay? Use face-to-face -face electronic communication. I love talking to someone face-to-face. -face. I love it. It's who I am, it's what I am, all right? Can't, can't deny who I am. What you see is what you get. So if you vote for me, may God have mercy on your soul. That's all I'm saying. Because you're going to get me. That's all I'm saying. You're just going to get me. Get me in a, in a complete package. All right, next please. Let's talk about communicating with gener Generation Xers. Now remember, what are Generation Xers? They come from what? Latch key families, right? Dysfunctional families. All right? So they're going to have some trust issues, right? So learn their language and speak it, whatever that language is. Next, please. Be brief and concise to hold their attention. We were taught in seminary that if you go over 30 minutes in a meeting or in a, in a message, you've just lost the attention of the folks out there. Well, if I was sitting out there and you were preaching to me, you lose my attention in 15 minutes because in 15 minutes I'm thinking about where I'm going to go eat. That's the gospel according to Dover, okay? So... Be brief, be concise, and make your point up front quickly. All right? Next, please. It's right there. Oh, use a direct style to prevent the facts. Women, we men love you. But you talk in riddles. And it drives us crazy. And if you were direct with us, we probably wouldn't spend so much time in the doghouse. Because I am poor at solving riddles. And when my wife, well, so we're driving down the road, and she wants coffee. She doesn't tell me she wants coffee. What she tells me is, would you like some coffee? No, no, I don't need no coffee. Let's go. Let's go. And then she's mad at me because I didn't want coffee. I'm like, what did I do? I'm just driving down the road. I don't want to have to go to the bathroom every 15 minutes. Only to find out that that was a message that she wanted me to stop and get coffee, all right? Challenge them and ask them for their input. Always have, it's not one-way conversation, guys, with Generation Xers. Ask them a question, give them a leading question that they can respond to. Make them feel part of the conversation. How does it make you feel when you get upset with somebody and you're just the only one talking? Or no, let me reverse that. You're being talked to, and you don't have a moment in there to respond to them. How does that make you feel? That's exactly how they feel. All right, next please. Share information with them immediately and often. There are no trade secrets in the, in the organization of the DAV. Zero. I told you that I will help you. I will give you information to the best of my ability. And if you've got something new that you want me to try, let me know. You're not going to be ostracized. Use informal communication style. Have you ever had one of those young guys come up to you and they're like talking to you like this, like they got no respect? Hats on crooked. Shorts down here around their knees. It's their style. Let me, let me take it a step further. Being infantry for 21 years, I can tell you that I used to cuss like a sailor. And when I hit my head on something, that old self comes out, okay? When they're talking to you in the only language they know, don't be judgmental. It's the only language they know. Don't say, oh, I'm a chaplain. You can't be discussing that with me in those kinds of words. It's the only language they know. They're, not, they're probably not of your faith. They don't know anything else except communicating that way. They're probably just fresh out of the military. Let them communicate. And then in your maturity, get them to tone it down a little bit or say, hey, how about a cup of coffee <laughs> that you didn't want earlier? <laughs> That's right. You guys as chaplains, you guys should be approachable all the time. You need to be approachable. If you build up walls, where no one can come to you, then how are the members going to express themselves when they have a problem with the commander? These, gen these generations 
of veterans that are coming now into our organization, it is our job to understand them. We may not agree with their lifestyles, we may not agree with their point of view, but they serve their country honorably and they have a right to be here. And you as a chaplain have a right to listen to them when they have a beef. And you may not want to listen to them. You may have the same veteran coming up to you 50 times. You're going to listen to them 50 times. You know how long it takes for me to get from the grand uh, ballroom up to my room? About an hour and a half. And you know what? I'm going to stop and talk to you if you want to talk to me. Because you elected me as your national chaplain. And it's my duty to hear what you have to say. And what you have to say may be just important enough for me to take it to Mark and Barry, because I've got the inside track with them. You guys have the inside track with your commanders. All right? Listen and show respect for their opinion. They may not be showing respect to you by the way they're standing, in the way they're dressed. That's them. That's the language they speak. But show them respect. All right? Email is their primary tool in communicating. All right, next, please. Now, let's communicate with millennials. We talked a little bit about them. Let words paint visual pictures to inspire and motivate. Use words to paint a picture. Look, I don't know about you, but I can't stand a dry sermon. And if I stood up here and I'm talking to you in a monotone voice, and I'm not fluctuating in my voice, and I'm not really, I'm just on and on and on, and I'm not really making my point, you're going to get tired of me real quick, fast, and hurry. That's all I'm saying. Use action verbs to challenge them. Hey, can you help me? What do you think about this? Okay? Next. Don't be condescending. Show respect. Okay, so they screwed up. Maybe they didn't get the financial report in on time. Okay. The world isn't going to stop. The financial market is still strong. And no one took any money out of my account. It's all good. So let's sit down and discuss how we're going to do this right. Okay? And what we can do to fix it. And when you see your commanders or officers behaving that way to these young, you as a chaplain need to step in and say, whoa, 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 let me, let me, let me deal with this issue. Because you're the one that's supposed to be down to earth, grounded, full of wisdom. That's your job. Constantly seek their feedback. And I'm not talking about Constantly means you may have to ask for it two or three times, but don't ask for it once and then three months later decide to ask for it again. Follow up maybe twice that week if you don't hear them the first time, and then maybe one week after that, but be consistently asking for the feedback. You may have to draw it out of them. Everyone is different, guys. I can tell you right now, in spite of what you know about me, I'd rather be at home, sitting in a chair, reading a good book, and rubbing the fur off the belly of my two miniature long hair dachshunds. That is the world according to Dover. But here I am, standing before you, talking to you, because of life circumstances that have thrust me in the limelight, and I wasn't looking for it. And yet you guys put up with my bad jokes. I don't understand you. I don't understand you at all. <laughs> your jokes are worse. <laughs> so, so we get to our next point, use humor. What does humor do? It tears down walls. You come up to him, then I give you a joke and you start smiling. I got inroads now, we can talk. Humor, 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 and I use it quite often in case you haven't noticed. And sometimes to my detriment. But I use humor to break down walls so that I can be approachable. And there are some tough nuts to crack out there, chaplains, but you have to find a way Figure that out, all right? Humor is one of the best ways to do that. Always encourage someone. Always. How many uh, got to hear me in the district meetings when I came by? Were you all present at some of those district meetings? I said some really crazy stuff, didn't I? I actually thanked you for the job that I have because you made my job easy. I go around smiling kissing babies, shaking hands, throwing, a, throwing an elbow once in a while, and you elected me to this position, but you do all the hard work. 
Every single one of you should be able to replace me. You should have that kind of attitude. You don't have to smile all the time. You don't have to be joyous and all that. It's not required. It's not, not a, but every single one of you should be able to replace me. When I step off, this organization shouldn't suffer. And these young people right here that we're talking about, they should be encouraged by you. And I do and I try to encourage. Now sometimes if you've been reading my articles, I put it out there. But I always try to follow up with some encouragement so that I don't leave a bad taste in your mouth. But there are some hard things that have to be discussed. All right? Just got to be. Next, please. And then use all the stuff they're using. How many here has Twitter account? Okay. For those of you who didn't raise the hand, you just lost the millennials. Because you don't understand what a Twitter account is, maybe. Or if you're not using it, how do you know how it functions? They're gone. Millennials don't even want to talk to you now because you don't understand it. Man, I wish the president never knew about the Twitter account. Good grief. Wow. But hey, you know what? It's America. You can do what you want as long as you don't hurt someone else or violate someone else's rights. That's how I believe. That's what I believe. Use what they're using to communicate. Next, please. All right? Communication calls for generations. We're going to talk about millennials specifically. Next. What does the millennial generation want to be when they grow up? Have you ever asked that question about looking at them? Well, let's find out. Go ahead and put them all up. I want you to read that. Here's what they think about corporations in general. This is your mill the millennials. They believe in that there's a scarcity of resources in the planet, so they believe in conservation, preservation. They believe in alternate fuels. Chain, climate change. 65% of millennials believe in climate change. 64% uh, believe in income equality. They believe the rich is getting richer and the poor is getting poor. That's what millennials believe. They want to be innovative. Go ahead and put it all up there. 78% of millennials were influenced by how a corporation was innovating. Are you hearing what I'm saying? 78% were influenced by how a corporation was innovating. Let's take it into our round, DAV. Hey, did you know we're using social media? Being innovative. What draws millennials? Being innovation. Twitters, tweeting. Texting, Facebook, we're being innovative. Nashville's got the picture. They understand. 78% of millennials speak their language. They're influenced by what you tell them if you're using what they're using. Management attitude, the biggest barrier to innovation, they believe that 63% believe that management attitude is the biggest issue in, uh, or management, excuse me, let me read this. Management attitude is the biggest block to innovation. Operational procedures, 61% believe that's the biggest block to innovation. Employment skills, attitudes, and, and uh, lace of diversity, 39% believe those are the wall that blocks innovation. They want to be leaders. The young people, think about this for a moment. We've all served in, the, in, in uh, various armed forces. We were all leaders at one time. So we get out of the army. We've been in charge of folks the whole time in uniform. Now we step out of the army and we're in charge of nothing. Zip, zilch, except ourselves. We've lost a sense of identity. And they want to be leaders. They want to be in charge. We need to foster that in them by guiding them. Chaplains, you need to cross that barrier between the commander and these new veterans, young veterans coming in and being able to bridge that gap in the language deficiency that our older veterans have with the younger veterans and the younger veterans have with the older veterans. 75% believe their organization can do more to develop future leaders. How is your chapter or department developing 
these young veterans when they come in? Are we properly training them? Or are we just throwing them in the position? Let me tell you how I got involved. I was an adjutant chapter level for seven years. When my father received 100% because of the DAV, I said, any organization that does that, I want to be part of. So I went to my local DAV chapter, and I'm sitting in with a whole bunch of older folks, and there's three or four vacancies up there at the head table. And when we get to the good of the order, I raise my hand, and I say, what can I do to help you? Well, that was the wrong question to ask. <laughs> so, can you take notes? Yeah, I can take notes. Adjutant. Oh, yeah, what is that? It's like a little, little child in a candy store. Yeah, that's it. I'll do something. Got there, and seven years later, they wouldn't let me go. But here's the deal, guys. That's exactly the same attitude that these young veterans have. They want to come in and do something. Give them something. I have said this at the district meetings, that it is not my goal to be in this position forever. Did I not say earlier that all of you should be able to replace me, right? So why do we have the mentality out there, chaplains, not chaplains, but commanders who've been a commander for 10 years and the chapter's not growing. Because we, is it just out of lack of bodies that we can't elect someone new to replace them because there's no one else showing up? Are we doing a poor job of membership drives to bring new members in? Or are we bringing them in, feeding them to the lines, and, they, and this young generation don't want to come out? Oh, that's a, that's a club for old men. Okay? We have to start thinking how they think if we want them to be involved in our organization. Next, please. Millennials want to make a difference. Didn't you want to make a difference when you got out of service? I know I did. Improving society. I told you they were communal. They love living together. They'll get four or five guys and they'll all share the rent, go out and buy food. They want to improve society. They don't like litter. They don't like the plastic. They don't want to go in the ocean. Giving to charities. They actually love giving to charities. 63%. They actively, 43% volunteer because it's about improving society, right? Member of a community organization. DAB is a perfect community organization to be part of. And chaplains, you should be that bridge that brings it together. All right, next please. If you fail to address a millennial's issues, if you fail to communicate with them, if you fail in any aspect of what I just told you, what, how a millennial thinks, they're gonna go out and work for themselves. 70% will go work for themselves. You know, I wonder if the reason why we have so many of these veteran organizations popping up is because somewhere along the line, one of these young veterans came into our organization or any organization, BSO, BFW, American Legion, whatever, and everything I just covered happened to them. They said, you know what? I'm going to go out and start my own project, Wounded Warrior. Paralyzed Veterans of America. Just went out there and did it because we were too hard-headed to see that we had talent at our door. Something that we need to consider. All right? All right, so let's review. I think you can read that for yourself, right? I hope so, because I'm going to give me some water. Next, please. This is where millennials think innovations are going to come from. 44% think it's going to come from business. That's not a very high figure. 23% think it's going to come from studying, getting some sort of degree. 22% think it's going to come from the government. And 6% Thing that's going to come from non-government organizations. That's where they think innovation is going to come from. Pretty low figures. So that means they don't think highly of those areas. If 78% of the millennials are driven by innovation, then should your chapter, your department, be following in line with what National's doing? Should you not be creating the things that, that uh, appeal to the millennial? Because we want to draw them in. Oh, in case you didn't know this, you only have so many years on this life. Now, I don't know what those years are, but what you leave behind as a legacy is what you invest in the young generation today. Tomorrow's not guaranteed, guys. 
No one promises you tomorrow. We just assume when we go to bed, we're going to wake up, but tomorrow's not guaranteed. So what have you done for some young veteran? What are you doing to train them to take your place? You're not working yourself out of a job. Think about this. Think of yourself as an elder. Once you get that young veteran in place that's replaced you in that job, your job is to guide and give them wisdom. With all that experience you have, if you just read my uh, latest article, Understanding Leadership, wisdom is by far, far cheaper. Experience is, ex it is expensive if we do not guide these new veterans into the position that we need. Next, please. All right. So here's the criteria for successful cross-generational relationships. Number one, you've got to be interested in generational differences. If you're refusing to talk to other generations because, well, this is the way we've done it for many years and that's the way it's going to be done, you just shut the door on any kind of relationship you can have. Didn't I just say at the beginning of this seminar that you, the chaplain, have to be approachable? We don't shut doors. Next, know your own generation. How do you know? The best thing to do is know yourself first. What are your limitations? What do you like? What are your dislikes? And sometimes it takes some effort to get over that to be able to communicate with someone else. Let me tell you, I, didn't, I told you I didn't know what a computer was, but I had that PFC with those horn room glasses. Sit down for three days. I think I sent him to lunch, I'm not sure. And he taught me everything I need to know about that computer because it was my job to know. Next. No other generations in general. You don't have to be a subject matter expert. I'm not asking you to go out and get 16 doctoral degrees, become a psychologist, and be able to read people's minds. I'm not asking you to do that. What I'm asking you is take what you already know about people because you served in the military, right, chaplains? Or you were married to a military guy. God bless my wife. I have taken her through hell and back. Boy, if she ever finds out that I got the better deal in this marriage, she'll leave me. So, what was said here stays here. No one talks to her. All right? I already did. Darn it. Cheese and crackers. All right. Avoid hoarding grudges from classes of other dinner. Why are we? I can't tell you how many veterans get upset because their PTSD kicks in and they were cut off in traffic by some young, young punk. Exact words. And then, of course, the the explicitives that came out of their mouth was something else to be awed and admired, I guess, because I didn't know that many cuss words. But my point being is, if you don't, if you hold a grudge with other generations, you just shut the door to communication. Chaplains, you are an open door. You are accessible at all times. Successful cross-generational relations, okay, next. Have positive feelings towards different generations. You may not like, I, I alluded to this earlier, you may not like what they wear. You may not like how they think, but they're a human being. They served our country honorably. They have a right to be here. We do not have a right to chase them out. Make them part of our family. And the only way we can do that, chaplains, is making sure that all those officers that have PTSD and take a medication, you're the balance in their life. All right? Not all, my, not all my advice is spiritual. Make sure we take our medications, right? Happy wife, happy life, that sort of thing. Okay? Focus attention on our thoughts, feelings, and behavior. Knowing yourself and how you react to something, you may have to change that in order so that you don't send the wrong signal when you're communicating. Recognize how our perception affects other encounters. Look, guys, think about... Yes, I have an article. If I'm reelected, I have an article coming out, or will submit, called PTSD and Offense. I'll just let you know it'll be out there about th three magazines out. If I'm reelected, I'm not taking anything for granted. You have to be careful what your perception is when you're communicating with this inner generation. Okay? Because they have to build trust, and if they're perceiving no trust, you just close the door. And chaplains, that's not your business. You're accessible. Be aware of the impact of our behavior on other generations. So other people looking at you, what was the old saying? If America looks at how the government treats the veterans and, we, and the government's treating them right, then usually we get a whole bunch of folks signing up for the armed forces, right? 
But if they see that we're not being well taken care of, which is DAD's mission, to ensure we are, then they're not going to join the service and continue on the honored traditions that we've all experienced in our life. So, that's the down and dirty of it, guys. Are there any questions as to what we just covered? All right, good. Appreciate it. <laughs> go, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I tried to be. Sorry. Uh, James Rubino. You don't sit down. Okay. okay. Yeah. We're not. We're not full over here. All right. Okay. We're chaplain. Uh, well, I'm a minister, but I'm not a chaplain, and I okay. have information on how I, I would like to be schooled on how to go about the process okay. of becoming legitimate chaplain. Okay. Of the okay. Did y'all hear the question? Okay. He said that he's a minister, but he's not a chaplain, and he wants to know about how to go about becoming a certified chaplain. I'm assuming that's what you're asking. Okay. So, did, did I? Okay. Guys, you're going to have to seek your own denominational. Yes, ma'am. Cheese and crackers. I'm a millennial. Oh, oh, and by the way, I'm a, I'm a boomer in 1964, but I, I, I'm more a millennial than a boomer. I understand. So I, I, that, that, and like I said at the beginning, when I was clarifying, I said uh, that's not an exact science about boomers and when the actual dates. That's just a generality of what the uh, subject matter experts think. So you you may be a combination of a little bit of both. Okay? They even break the boomers up into two sections. But anyway, let me answer your question. The question is is no, I don't train you. I'm a non-secretarian national chaplain in this in this format. But you can go to your denomination preference and look up and find out what requirements they have to become a chaplain. Okay? Now, I don't know all the inner work. I know where I got my certification from. Okay? Anybody can do that. You can go out, and there are plenty of schools, colleges, universities, seminaries where you can go and take what you need to become a certified chaplain. All right? But, 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 but before we... But, but before we go down that road, what is the requirement to be a chaplain in the Disabled American Veterans? You have to be... Uh, <laughs> thank, thank you, Lisa. You have to be dishonorably... Uh, oh. Oh. Oh, no, 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 we're stop. That's the, that's the sleep coming out of me. Uh, you have to be honorably discharged from your service and a member in good standing. That's all you have to be a chaplain in the DAV. If you want to go out beyond that scope and do what you need to do, then you'll need to go out and search for what's the best thing for you to do. But the DAV does not sanction any kind of, or does not recommend any kind of seminary or programs. That's on you. All you have to do is have served your country honorably and care. Don't take the position if you don't care. If you're taking the position because you think it's a springboard to another position, you are wrong. You must care. All right? Read my article, Understanding Leadership. I got all that in there. Okay, guys? Any other questions? Yes, sir. inclusive prayers that's not specific to our faith. Now, I abbreviated that. Was that correct? Okay. The ritual book that we publish, that you get, has some prayers in there. Okay? You can use those prayers. They're canned prayers. I don't like using them. Because the ritual book is just a guide. 
So you can go out there and write your own prayers. If you'll notice that all my prayers start with Heavenly Creator. Okay? Starts with Heavenly Creator. Pretty much encompasses everything. All right? I'm just being generalized. I'm not offended that I'm not praying according to my faith because this is a formality. That's all this is. I'm praying in the context of the Constitution and bylaws that's mandated by you, the member, who approved those Constitution and bylaws. That's how I'm praying, okay? So don't come up here and bite my hand later and say, Chaplain, I disagree with you. You can disagree, it's okay, I don't mind. I got scars all over my body. They heal pretty good. I notice though that as I get older, they don't heal so much. But anyway, point being is I'm digressing to the question that was asked. I've had, and we'll cover this because we covered this at the beginning of the uh, meeting before it all started. The ritual book is generalized prayers that you can use over and over again if you want. I choose not to. I like to do my own thing. But I've heard people tell me, Chaplain, you've got to use those prayers out of that ritual book. Well, if you ask Ed Hartman, it's a God. So if I have to use the prayers out of the ritual book, then why aren't we setting up our chapter meetings in a square like the ritual book says to set them up? You can't have one without the other. If that's how you're going to be, if you're going to staunchly tell me i got to use the prayers out of the ritual book, then everything in that ritual book is going to be by the ritual book. Now, didn't we just cover with the generations that sometimes you've got to let them free think for their own self and let them expand out? Well, that's not giving them the opportunity to do that. We're not communicating when we write stuff in stone. It's just a guidebook. And I want you chaplains to understand that. So when someone says, where's the ritual book? You need to use the ritual book. Use the same thing, excuse I just told you. Well, then I want the meeting set up in a square. Okay? You have to know your members. You have to know what the membership makeup is. And then formulate your own prayers. And you can do a good job of that. Everyone in here can do that without having to go denominational, okay? Or of a specific religious faith. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about including a Jewish rabbi and a Muslim cleric in my memorial services. Aren't we all encompassing? Now, when I do that, I wonder how many jaws are gonna drop. What's the chaplain doing? Well, I'm being all encompassing. But you know what? Be judged, I'll be judged. Sure enough, I'll be judged. Chaplains, you will be judged too with the decision to make. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Before you ask, did I answer your question? Okay. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, no. We talked about the Lord's Prayer. And here's the reason why it's not appropriate in this, con in this format. Our Father, which is the first two words in, is, is something the Muslims have a problem with. Yes. Yes, yes, and indeed. Jewish. Now, 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 here's the deal. I don't have time. What time is it? I have. Uh, oh, we good. I yeah. got 15 minutes. I don't have time to go into the reasons for it, but would, would be happy to talk because at 4 o'clock, I've got to be somewhere else, okay? But no, it's not appropriate. So we're talking about non secretary prayers, and the Our Father specifically Christian, is it not? All right, so. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well, and you can't use Jesus' name because Muslims don't believe Jesus was the Son of God. And therefore, they believe he's a prophet, and that's all he was. So now you've got, you know, now you start to talk about some deep uh, cultural, religious, you know, discussion here, and I don't want to go down that road. But, but sir, did I answer your question? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I agree. I, you don't have to agree. You don't have to agree. Okay? It's okay. You don't have to agree. But we have to live by the mandate of the Constitution by law. Right, right. I'm with you. Yes, If you'll come up here and give me your email address. The, the question was, can I email this to this fine young lady over here? I will email it to anybody if you leave me your email address. Okay. You'll get a copy. Of the whole seminar? Of the whole seminar. I, I have no trade secrets. I get paid the big bucks. <laughs> yeah. Wait a minute. <laughs> Please, no more promotions. All right. Any more questions, guys? Yes, sir. Okay. This will come out. Here's what happens. Once the convention's over and the uh, nominating or the convention committee and the members agree to the changes to this book, 
in about two months, they'll pr print a new book. And it will be sent to your adjutants and chapter commanders to include the department commanders and department adjutants. They'll all get a copy, all right? So what you're going to have to do is get with your chapters and ask for a copy of this. Now, anybody know what these colors are based on? What, why they choose the colors for each Constitution Bowl every year? It's whoever wins the Super Bowl. <laughs> it's whoever wins the Super Bowl is the color that they choose for the Constitution bylaws. That's how we know, guys. Now you know. That's how they choose the color. All right, guys. Any other questions?